Hello there, and welcome to the Frank and Mary show on Nantucket. Our friend Arthur Bergeron got stuck off island and is not going to be here for today's show, which I know he would, he's really missing because we're talking about a project that is dear to him, the Conversation Project. Um, I have here with me today a very special guest, Gloria White Hammond. Um, she is a pastor and a retired physician mm -hmm. and has been on Nantucket for this part of this week to talk about um, end of life. Um, so let's talk about the Conversation Project. Sure, sure. Well, I first uh, became involved with the Conversation Project about five years ago when I realized that I did not have my advanced care plans in place. And the Conversation Project was available. My good friend Rosemary Lloyd, who was overseeing particularly the faith aspect of the work, contacted me and we agreed to hold a, uh, a meeting with my members of my church and I anticipated that 10 people would come so that we could learn about the Conversation Project and begin the process of talking through our wishes for end of life care. And we were surprised that 40 people showed up. Wow. So there was a lot of interest in talking about what was, what was the next uh, stop along that continuum that we call life, and that is a transition to death. Wow, and so channeling Arthur here, um, he would want me to find out if you were a wash ashore or give a little background of sure, who, who you are. So. Sure, I, I am a wash ashore wannabe, <laughs> but in fact, uh, I've, I've not spent a good bit of time on Nantucket. I am from Boston, where uh, for many years I've been a pediatrician. I've practiced for almost 30 years in Boston South End at a community health center there. I'm also a pastor. After doing my training and well into my practice, I went back to seminary and uh, completed my degree there and then became ordained. And I, along with my husband, serve as pastor for a, a wonderful congregation in Jamaica Plain. And I've done some other things along the way. I retired from my pediatric practice about 10 years ago because I was doing a good bit of international work with an organization called My Sister's Keeper. Which, which you founded. Yes, which yeah. I did, along with some other um, stalwart uh, warrior women <laughs> who recognized uh, the plight of women who were victims of conflict uh, in a number of zones around the world. And we organized to provide humanitarian support. We were particularly committed to a, a community in South Sudan. We helped them to, with girls' education, we built the first permanent school in their community and supported that work for many years. I then became involved in advocacy work, especially around the Save Darfur movement, and particularly advocating for women as victims and also as peace builders. So that was a big, big chunk of my right. work doing anti-slavery work. And, and then when I came back, I, I, that was there because I was so keenly aware of the kinds of injustices that women experience as a result of violence. And then came back and said, you know what? It's not only over there. There's a lot of that that goes here as well. So that's a, a, an important bucket mm -hmm. of my work as well. And you're here in Nantucket working with PASCON, Palliative I am. and Supportive Care on Nantucket. Yes, PASCON, which I absolutely love. I think it is the, the most wonderful model for how an entire community can especially embrace this conversation project and begin to think through as individuals and, and individuals in community, how do we get ready for the thing that is we're all going to experience at some point, which is end-of-life care. And how do we do that in a way, anticipate that, and prepare for that in such a way that, as I say, we make for a smooth transition, we can die well. And so the Conversation Project is helping people discuss their wishes for end-of-life care. Absolutely. And they have a wonderful website, which is resource-rich. And the basic uh, bit of information that one would uh, download is the starter kit. And that really guides people into having conversations to think first of all about what, might, what some of their fears might be with regard to dying, what some of their hopes might be. It really supports them to think about a healthcare proxy or a healthcare agent, someone who could speak for you if you're not able to speak for yourself and help you think through some of the interventions that you might want or might not want. And 
begins to coach people in terms of thinking about some of those other basic things, the kinds of things that Arthur works with as far as wills and trusts and financial stewardship. So the Conversation Project is a great place to begin. And I love the idea of Nantucket being a conversation-ready community. And, that, and, and with the um, pastoral groups and the PASCON and the other people that are interested, um, how, how do they get other people involved in that? Sure. Part? Well, I actually met with the, the Interfaith Council just this past week. It was, it was great. We had between 15 and 20 different spiritual leaders representing um, through a Buddhist community, we had a Catholic, Protestant. It was just absolutely wonderful. They work well together. And I introduced the conversation project to them for We've been using this at our congregation at Bethel for about five years now, a part of what we call planning ahead. So we introduced the conversation project, and then we introduced the tool that we have found very helpful in terms of people actually writing down some of those wishes, what we call, uh, it's called five wishes. Again, it's something that you can easily download and, and uh, just follow the directions and it invites people to identify their health care proxy, to consider what sorts of interventions they might consider if they were, again, not in a position to talk and might need some life support. It invites people to think about uh, issues of dignity, what are the, that was critical to them as they die well, uh, or comfort. And what I also love about it is thinking through those other important conversations, not only funeral planning, um, and what hymns I might want sung at my funeral, but also some of beginning to tackle some of the relational issues that can make the process of dying so, so messy. And, uh, and so I walked them through that, and we found that very helpful, began to imagine what it would be like to have those conversations with their congregants. And we finished up by challenging them to be Exhibit A with regard to how this feels to have these conversations and to actually begin documenting my wishes. So the five wishes, is that a legal, a legally binding document or how does, how does that work as sure. far as um, um, the follow five, through? Sure, the five wishes is, um, does not require notarizing. It does become a, a legal document. It doesn't require notarization in the state of Massachusetts. And it's more, I'd say to people, the most important thing is that you at least have conversations and communicate with five wishes and other documents such as that does, as allow people to actually write those things down on paper. And, uh, and then it becomes a tool that we can use to communicate, first to think, and then to communicate and to share that with other people who, who, who care. So you can share it with your physician. And it's been really exciting for me to have some of the stories from my congregants as they've taken their five wishes to their doctor and to have their doctor say, well, where did you get that? And then to have them say, well, this came from my church. And my church is very committed to supporting me and thinking about my end of life wishes. And that again just starts the conversation all it over does. again, first with your physician and then the people that you're talking about Absolutely. with it. Um, so does it become part of your medical record or how do you know it, that that's... It, 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 it does become part of your medical record. Now different hospitals have different ways of um, including people's um, wishes with regard to end of life, most all of them will certainly have a, a place to talk about, to identify your health care proxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but different hospitals um, uh, have different ways of documenting that. At Brigham and Women's, it's scanned and it's in my medical record. And I think at Beth Israel, it be, there's another way to include it in the electronic records. But the main thing is, that you have a copy, you make sure that your doctor at least has a hard copy. And then certainly the persons that you would identify as your healthcare agents need copies. Mm -hmm. So um, how did you um, come to this work? Well, so I, I came to it especially by, um, in a couple of different contexts. Uh, when my, um, both my, my mother and my husband's mothers, after, after our fathers died, uh, we were, they were still living and, uh, and living well. And remarkably, both of them just did tremendous jobs of planning ahead. I, I'd say my mother, who was, uh, had eight children, I, and growing up, I hadn't remembered her being particularly organized. But of course, <laughs> on this side, I said anybody who had managed to get eight children out alive and well must have been extremely well organized. 
but after my dad died, I, over those few years that she had left, she, she just got organized. She, she saw someone like Arthur uh, to understand what are some of the critical pieces and, and thinking through, uh, preparing for the end of life. She actually, she set up a will, she set up a trust so that when she died, everything was covered. And that was a gift to the eight of us because we, eight children uh, squabbling over. I say to people, if you have a little family, you have little problems. If you have a big family, you have big problems. And that, so I, I so much appreciated that. And then with regard to my husband's mom, she had Alzheimer's and lived with us for the last 11 years wow. of her life. She had had a modest income, which she managed extremely well, uh, so that when she came to live with us, she actually came with a, a bucket of finances, which very much facilitated our being able to hire people. We were able to find wonderful, wonderful um, caregivers. Uh, we had access to a, a wonderful facility, a day program for patients with Alzheimer's, and the critical support of a community, which again is something I think Nantucket brings to the table. And, and we were able to walk with her through the, through the end and at the point that we needed hospice care, we had great hospice support. So I watched them and seeing their example, knew that that was something that I needed to do for my, myself and for <laughs> my children as well. Wow, that's, um, that's a great, story. All right, well, let's talk about Ira Byrock. Okay, let's talk about Ira Byrock's work. I wanted the, have, doing this work with our congregants, and again, our congregation is about 500 members. Oh. On any given Sunday, we will have between maybe 275 people in worship, and of the congregation, over 200 of us have engaged in these conversations with, for, to talk about advanced care planning. Again, the ministry that we have is called Planning Ahead. And one of the reasons that we've continued to do this in the, with such robust report is because people come out of the experience with stories about how encouraged they are having these conversations, having the weight taken off of them, that first of all, thinking and dealing with the reality that at some point sooner or later I will transition, and that they, that, that just feels right, and that they, they met with the funeral director, and that's just one thing that they don't have to worry about with their loved ones. One of the other reasons that it has been such an encouragement is particularly when we start to think through tying off some of the loose ends in terms of our relationships. How do we yeah. do that? And we've looked to the work of Ira Bayak, uh, who is a palliative care specialist, uh, who um, talks about the conversations that he has learned are so important when people are facing end of life. And his first book referenced five things that matter most in terms of dying well. Those five things are uh, the ones that I think are really tough around forgiveness. So the first thing is forgive me because in the context of our relationship, we've, I've done some things and I'm sorry. And the second thing is, and I forgive you uh, because there's some things that you've done that um, have really weighed heavily, but I want you to know I'm forgiving you. I'm not forgetting it, I'm not trying to get over it, but I'm acknowledging that I no longer want to hold you hostage with the, by not forgiving you, so I forgive you. Uh, we pause to say thank you, and we often don't do that in life, but to, to travel back and think through some of the, the ways that people have made a difference, um, and I thank you for it. Um, Fourth, I love you. Oh. I reaffirm my love for you. And uh, the fifth one would be goodbye. And I, it's been gratifying to talk with our members and hear their stories. It's, I've, I've done that now with, started to do that work with my siblings. And uh, again, they're, you live a long life and there are a lot of things. And it's been gratifying to just say to one another, and I didn't understand that, um, and, and 
but I'm sorry for the role that I played and, and I forgive you for the role that you played. And so, and so this conversation would be from the person who's dying? Or it, it's initiated by, or well, the, the freedom in the initial to? work that Ira Bayak did, it was really for the person who was dying in conversation with their loved ones. But what we're finding is that we have members who are living, and certainly I'm living, and uh, my sibs aren't aren't dying. But we're we're starting to work through some of these things. These are the things that make Thanksgiving and holidays so. Oh gosh, here comes Uncle Joe again, or I don't want, you know, I don't want Cousin Mary at my table. These are the, the sorts of things that, that make the living difficult, and we don't need to do that. It becomes a weight. I mean, I've seen parents that don't want to discuss it with their children, yes, yes. and then children who don't want to discuss it with their parents. Yes, um, yes. How would you begin a conversation in a setting like that if, you're, if your mother doesn't want to talk about it? Well, what, what we have found has been, again, a very useful tool is first having the conversation for yourself. One of the reasons that I like the idea of documenting it, and again, there are any number of documents that people can look at, uh, but I've liked the five wishes because I, I think it's, it's very user-friendly and, again, gets at not only the, the medical aspects of it, but some of the emotional and relational aspects as well. And what I've suggested to people is you do it for yourself and then give it to your loved one. I know you're not ready to discuss this. I understand that. But when you're ready, these are some of my thoughts and, um, and just either take a look at it or put it away in a drawer when you're ready, look at it, and we can discuss it. And so you'd fill it out with yourself being the person making the wishes and then share it with your, mm -hmm. lo your mm -hmm. loved one so as these an example? Are, these are my, my mm -hmm. wishes, my thinking. And then it gets witnessed by uh, a couple of other people. And for us, it, one of the m most um, deeply spiritual interactions that we've had is when my husband and I each did our five wishes, we came together with two other couples that we have known for years. And, uh, and they discussed their five wishes, and, and, and we all had a discussion. And we witnessed each other's discussion. We learned a lot about one another. And uh, again, it was just a, a sacred space for us to, for all of us to acknowledge um, how much we've enjoyed working together and recognizing that there will be a day when that will be done. Yeah. So you've also met with the staff at the Nantucket Cottage Hospital. Yes. Tell and me a little bit about that. It was a wonderful um, interaction. And there, what I focused on, and most of the people were involved in palliative care, which is that newest subspecialty in medicine that uh, focuses on supporting individuals and families with serious illness uh, by uh, addressing the helping them with symptom management and it's um, and it's it's another it's a subspecialty that helps people to to live well while they're in the process of transitioning whether that's sooner or later and approaches it in a comprehensive way, not only the medical, but also the psychosocial and spiritual aspects of, um, of their lives. And I asked the, the people to focus especially on the spiritual aspects, recognizing that for many clinicians in my years as, uh, as a provider, that people were either awkward talking about spirituality or sometimes even hostile. I think one of the exciting developments that I've seen in medicine is that people are they're being more receptive and at least understanding that for many people spirituality matters and there are many people who make decisions on the basis of their their spiritual leanings so we talked about some of the data that suggests that spirituality matters and the importance of the medical team addressing that that you um, that people are more likely to have the, some of the things that we talk about in terms of uh, a good death, uh, that patients are, um, are likely to live a little bit longer and in the presence of, of death that the, the, the health care givers um, actually have less post-traumatic stress syndrome. So just addressing the spiritual issues matters for patients and it, you have better, pay, better outcomes. So we talked about that. And one of the other conversations that I had with the, the clergy people was how to support people when they're diagnosed with serious illnesses, how, to, how we can provide even more effective pastoral support. Um, and, and that's also something that 
that PASCON provides as it well. It does, it does. And people often think of palliative medicine as only being end of life right. care, as mm -hmm. only hospice, but that's not at all the case. It, the palliative medicine gets involved once the diagnosis is established. We're not sure what the outcome will be. Right. <clears throat> I know that I know that PASCON um, is not linked to any hospice mm -hmm. program, and so therefore the services that they, that they provide are care caregiver support, yes. and from the moment that you get a diagnosis, whether it's terminal or not, mm -hmm. if it's life-threatening, mm -hmm. you can avail their services, which are really incredible. It's so so incredible. Yeah, people wait until, people think that hospice and PASCON are are similar, mm -hmm. and they and they are, but yeah. palliative and supportive mm -hmm. care on Nantucket Absolutely. is what PASCON stands for. Absolutely. And they are a great resource. They are, I wish I could clone PASCON mm -hmm. and put it in every community around the country. If I could figure out how to get that in Boston, that would be great. But the opportunity for uh, people who are in spiritual communities is to, to be PASCON for one another. Is there anything else that we want to talk about? One of the uh, questions that, that does come up with regard to end-of-life care is the issue of resuscitation and, uh, and whether or not if you were to have a sudden event, would you want to be resuscitated? And that's a conversation to actually have with a physician. In the state of Massachusetts, we have what's called a MOLST form, the Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And a patient in conversation with their physician would talk about the implications of, of again, which life support treatments, either CPR or ventilator, um, uh, use of ventilator, and whether or not that the patient would want to be resuscitated. Typically, that's for someone who is 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 very ill and, and clearly and tends to be identifiable as, as term, terminal, either because of the nature of their illness or sometimes even because of their age. Um, and if your doctor agrees, and, and the two of you agree that you will not be resuscitated, then there will be a little, some, a little sign, a magnet that you can put on the refrigerator. Sometimes people have bracelets. And what that means is if the EMTs come, if, if, if if I have an event now and the EMTs come and I, it's clear that I don't want to be resuscitated once they see that out of respect for, for my wishes, they, they would not resusc resuscitate. In the absence of that, by default, um, they will resuscitate and take me to the, to the hospital, hospital and, and start, it off, start, yeah. start it off. And if, at, if I, it then becomes clear subsequently that I did not want to be resuscitated, my physician understood that, then what it says is once they know that, then they would stop those life support measures. Yeah, so I've seen, um, they have them at the fire station mm -hmm. and they'll be at the Elder Expo, yes. which is going to be next Saturday, the 19th. That's great. Um, so the little red placards that stick to your fridge will be there yeah. and everyone should have one, yeah. I think, or yeah. just you know have access to uh -huh. them for some, when they need them. Some, some clear indication, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, Gloria, it's been so great to meet you. I've heard great things about you. <laughs> Everyone here has been really extremely pleased with what you brought to the island, and um, we we'll hope to see you again sometime. Well, thank you so much. Again, I can't say enough about how awesome it is, and just, I haven't met Arthur, but I saw some of those clips, and for him to have a vision for this is just great, and you all are doing amazing work. I hope you will take this show on the road <laughs> to other communities. <laughs> well, Arthur does have other communities that he does a similar show to, but I do want to make um, an announcement. Arthur is having at the Salt Marsh um, on Thursday, the 24th of October, a seminar called Making the Last, the Best. Making the last of your life as good as it can be. I'll say that again. Making the last of your life as good as it can be. Um, and it will be Thursday, the 24th of October at 3 p.m. at the Salt Marsh. Um, you can call there if you'd like to sign up for it, but Arthur will be here, weather permitting, um, to lead that seminar, and he'll talk a little bit about the Conversation Project. So when it comes to the Conversation Project, is that ever too y are you ever too young to start it? You're not too young to start it. In fact, uh, for people who are 18 years and older, we recommend that they have advanced directives in place where they
clearly identify their health care proxy and, and again, uh, what we identify as living wills. One of the things that's also gratifying at Bethel is, with our planning ahead, is when we began, most of our participants, it was around 60-ish, and now as we continue to have this conversation, our age range is typically around 40, so we have uh, young couples who are engaged or having their first baby who are recognizing the importance of having these conversations as well. So I didn't, this is a family affair. Mm -hmm. And so what advice would you have to a family where someone couldn't care for their ailing parent mm -hmm. in their own home because of their own family situation mm -hmm. or the distance between? How can you help people with or give a resource for when it's you know, what options are there for not in-home care, yeah, or yeah. when is the time to talk about um, assisted living of some type? Sure. Well, that's a great question, Allison, and it's a very difficult one, and it's one that I, I, I thank you for naming that. Uh, what I've certainly arrived at is is no judgment. Let me just start with that, and, and, and I reference the fact that we are able to care for uh, our mom in our home, and we were very privileged to do that. But I recognized that that's not easy and everybody can't do that. So that's the first thing is to, uh, is to let go as best one can of that sense of guilt and then begin to look around for resources. Uh, fortunately, on, um, on Nantucket, you, you do have some, you, you do have at least one resource available with the, uh, our, our island, island. Our island home, yes. Our island yeah. home, right. Uh, and then you've got PASCON. I don't know what other supports there are in place. I think it can be very helpful um, uh, to involve someone who can provide some emotional support for the family that's needing to make that difficult decision and appreciate it's not easy. And perhaps that question about letting go is something that you can have when you're talking about the conversation project. I mean, yeah. that's part of the whole idea yeah. around um, the conversation yeah. project is. And I'd say one of, boy, there's, this is a whole other conversation. Um, certainly there are some things as, I'm in that age group now where I, I would start to look at options. I'm doing well and I, I'm so grateful for that, but I'm now starting to anticipate a day when I wouldn't be able to care for myself. And uh, I think that's another reason why people we want to have these conversations and, to, and begin to imagine what the possibilities would be. Uh, and if in general you're, you anticipate that your children will be involved in providing that support and your children live far away, then sooner than later anticipate that you might want to transition to be in the community where your child is. Great. Um, well, thank you very much again. Thank you again. Yeah.